Hi, my name is Jeremy, and we are at the Creation Museum before it opens. It's going to open here real soon, and we have something exciting to show you today. I am with Tim, the content manager for the attractions, and we are in a I'm new exhibit. Exciting, right? oh, oh, very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we are in a new exhibit, and uh, tell us a little bit about where we are right now. All right, well, we are at the end of the walkthrough in the Creation Museum. If you've been here before, you know that the museum is designed around this concept of the seven C's. So you start with creation, then you go to corruption, which is the fall, catastrophe, which is the flood. Just zoom in on that. Uh, and then, yeah, so here are the seven C's right here. And then uh, confusion at the Tower of Babel. And so if you are looking at this room here where the, the camera is pointed, this is our Babel room. So this is the fourth C. And in the past, you would walk beyond that, and there would be a lobby, a little waiting area, and then there was a theater where you could watch what we called the Last Adam film, which kind of summarized the last three C's, Christ, Cross, Consummation. Well, as of Memorial Day weekend, which was the 10th anniversary of the Creation Museum, we opened up a brand new exhibit on Christ, Cross, Consummation. So instead of watching the film, which you can still see in Legacy Hall or in Special Effects Theater, now you have an exhibit that you can walk through that takes you through those last three C's. So it really uh, wraps up the entire museum around those seven C's. Well, can you take us a tour through this new exhibit and show us what, what it's about? Absolutely. So we, one of the things we have to do is we want to bridge the gap between Babel and the time of Christ. And, of course, we don't have space to cover the whole Old Testament and everything that uh, we need to talk about there. But one of the things the Old Testament does is it gives us prophecy after prophecy after prophecy telling us who the Messiah would be, who the Savior would be. And so what we wanted to do is, is explain that in this sign where we talk about the purpose of Old Testament prophecy so that people would, would be able to recognize the Savior when he, in, when he would come. And so that bridges us, that takes us from Babel to the time of Christ. And what we see throughout the Old Testament, we see different types of prophecies. We see several of them related to the birth of the Savior, that he'd be born of a virgin in Bethlehem. It even tells us what line he would be from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and later on uh, through Judah and through David. But then we see certain details about his ministry, uh, some of the things he would do. He would be a prophet, priest, and king. Uh, he would be a miracle worker. Uh, we see the way that people would respond to him, that his own people wouldn't really even receive him. They would reject him. He'd be betrayed by, you know, by a friend for 30 pieces of silver. He'd be severely beaten. Um, but he would also be hailed as the, as the Messiah. So we see all of those things in the Old Testament. And those of you who are familiar with the New Testament know that this is exactly what happened. And then the Old Testament also prophesied that the Messiah would die. Uh, that he would be mocked, he'd be ridiculed, uh, his hands and feet would be pierced, lots would be cast for his clothing, he'd be put to death as a sacrifice for our sins. And uh, both Isaiah 53 and Daniel 9 talk about that. And it doesn't end there because the Old Testament also prophesied that Jesus would rise from the dead, well, that the Messiah would rise from the dead, uh, that he would be buried in a rich man's tomb, but he'd only be there for a short while, that... Um, that the, in Psalm 16:10 it talks about how you will not allow your Holy One to uh, see decay, and then he would live again after his death. So all of those things are foretold in the Old Testament, and then when we move to the New Testament, we see Jesus fulfilling all of those details. And it's not just as if somebody got up one day and said, you know, I'm going to try to fulfill those prophecies, because nobody could say, hey, Mom, I've got to make sure I'm going to be born in Bethlehem. And make sure you're a virgin when this happens. <laughs> Nobody could do that from the womb. Um, so these aren't, some of these are not things that he could, if he were just a mere man, that he could make them happen by himself. So we see that God is, has foretold the future because it's just as easy for God who knows all things to tell the future as it is for him to tell the past because he knows both perfectly. So uh, that's, that's what this purpose, or the, this wall is the introduction of the Savior, and we wanted people to see that the Old Testament really introduced us to who the Savior is. Right. It's important to explain the history, you know, how it started, the foundation, before you get into um, the Gospels. Uh, that's exactly right. And so then we wanted to introduce people, so we've got the introduction of the Savior, but then something that most people are familiar with, and this is the, the nativity or the, the arrival of the Savior is what we've called this, um, where Jesus is born of a virgin in Bethlehem, and we see the announcement to the shepherds by the angels, and of course the shepherds go that night, and, and they see the, the child uh, lying in a manger, wrapped in swaddling cloths, and you know, later on, we don't picture it here, but later on the, the wise men you know, appear maybe a year or two later. Um, so, but the purpose of this section is not just to remind people of a 
heartwarming story at Christmas time like we usually talk about. But um, the name Emmanuel, the Bible says that he would be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's who Jesus Christ is. He's God in the flesh. He's not just somebody who, who came down and was a popular teacher and then was put to death by the Romans. He came here for a divine purpose. And it wasn't just to give us a heartwarming story at Christmas time. It was something that we would, that we're going to see later on in the exhibit, right. why he came. If any of you have any questions while you're here, feel free to post it in the comments and we'll answer them here today. Yep. And I can talk about the artwork real quick. I'm, I'm not an artist by any stretch of the imagination. I can't draw a stick figure, at least not a symmetrical one. But I got to work with the talented team who did this. And we had three guys, uh, Travis, Ben, and Greg. So a little shout out to those guys. Each one of them worked on each of the pieces throughout this exhibit. So one day, Travis would be working on this piece, then he would hand it off to Greg, who would work on it for the next day, and then the next day, Ben would work on it. And they did that with each of the pieces, and it really created a unique style throughout. And that way, it wasn't just one particular individual style. It was a blending of all three of them. And I think you'll see as we go through, it's really quite spectacular. Right. And of course, there's always artistic license when you have this type of artwork done. Oh, of course. I mean, we don't know if this is what Mary looked like, but I like that we portrayed her in a way that's a little bit different than how you usually see her. You know, usually she's dressed in blue and white, and that's all you... Then you know right away, oh, it's Mary. But that, those typically weren't colors worn by women, the uh, Jewish women at that time. Um, so what it's a little... head covering? Every, any time that I remember as a child, or maybe my sisters, not me, of course, uh, portrayed Mary, I always had a head covering and say, I'm Mary. Yeah, well... You know, the Bible does talk about the head covering issue in, in 1 Corinthians, and, you know, that's a little bit later on. That's maybe right. another 50, 60 years on um, with maybe a, a different culture, the Corinthian culture. But this is something that happens right after childbirth as well, mm -hmm. this picture. So would she have still been wearing that during that whole procedure? Uh, right. I, yeah, that's, that, that's what we have to remember to keep in mind there. Sure. Um, so we've got the announcement to the shepherds. And then the next part of the exhibit, it, there's really like 10 different sections of this exhibit is to talk about who Jesus really is. We've, we've talked about it just briefly when we say that his, he's Emmanuel, God in the flesh. But so many people have been misled in our culture about who Jesus is. You know, the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses say that Jesus is just a created being. He's a, a God, he's a powerful God, but he's not God Almighty. He's not a member, you know, second person of the Trinity, right. which is what we believe. Uh, Muslims say that he's just a prophet. There's some skeptics, someone would say he never even lived. You know, the, the Christ mythers, uh, we've got an article on our website about that to, to refute that. But then a lot of them would just say, well, no, he was just this popular teacher and legends grew up about him sure. after time. But who did Jesus say he was? What, that's what we want to look at. Is what did he say about himself? What did the rest of the Bible say about him? Well, John tells us that, that Jesus said he's God. Um, he uses God's divine name. Um, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Uh, he tells them that I, I and my father are one in John 10.30. And then he even claims to have the power to forgive sins and, and when he heals the paralytic. So who else can forgive sins but God alone? Well, that's who Jesus is. He's making those claims over and over again uh, throughout the New Testament. And it's more than just these three. We just couldn't put a, you know, 30 verses on one sign. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> Um, and then we see that Jesus is declared to be the creator. John 1 tells us that, Je uh, Colossians 1 and Hebrews 1 all tell us that Jesus is the creator. So uh, he was in the beginning with God you know, when God created everything. So he claims to be God. The Bible says he's the creator. And then there's these seven famous I am statements from the Gospel of John. You know, I am the bread of life, the light of the world, the door, which we talk about at the Ark Encounter quite a bit, um, the good shepherd. He is the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the vine. These aren't statements that would be made by somebody who is just a popular teacher. You know, these are statements right. made by somebody who knows exactly who he is. He's making very bold claims that, that other people would not make. And yet he's going to demonstrate that all of these things are true. So this is what the Bible tells us about who Jesus is. And it's just a summary. Again, we don't have room to, to explain everything. Sure. So the next section is um, was the teachings of Jesus, but how do you how do you summarize all of the teachings of Jesus? Because you have four gospels that explain so many different things, and because this is at the Creation Museum, and we talk quite a bit about the Book of Genesis, we thought, well, let's see what Jesus had to say about the Book of Genesis. And uh, what we see is that 
whenever he refers to events or people in there, he treats them as literal history. Mm -hmm. And unlike uh, so many people in the church today who are, who are teaching and being taught that, you know, maybe it's just allegorical, maybe it's metaphorical, you don't really need an actual Adam, you don't need a Garden of Eden, all of those things. Uh, well, Jesus said Abel was a real person. He talks about him being the first person who had been murdered. Um, he quotes from Genesis 1 and 2 when talking about marriage and uh, well, divorce and, and remarriage. And then in Luke 17, he talks about Noah and the flood and the ark. And he confirms that all of those were historical events. So if the Son of God, God in the flesh, is saying these are real events, and he was there at the beginning and he's the creator, how should we as Christians who say we follow Jesus Christ, how should we view, view Genesis? Right. And, I mean, everything that we observe from the Bible is consistent with science of what we observe. Isn't that right? Well, yeah, that's what we believe. We, we think that when we look at the world around us, you know, what we do is we create these different models. And that's really laid out at the Ark Encounter pretty well in some of the scientific exhibits. You have, here's the evidence, here's what we see. And then you see the popular secular interpretation, and oftentimes that includes the Big Bang, evolution, billions of years. And then here's our interpretation based on what Scripture says. And it's, people think it's a science versus faith issue. It's not. It's a worldview about the past versus worldview about the past. Well, not just the past, the past and the future for both of them. Um, it really comes down to it's a spiritual war. Satan is going to be deceiving people as he can, and when it comes down to it, it's just another attack, you know, on, on the God's word, you know, just back in Genesis 3 where he's saying, did God really say, well, it's kind of happening here too. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, Paul tells us, and sometimes we forget this in the church today, we are in a spiritual battle. Paul says in Ephesians 6 that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. You know, the atheist, the agnostic, right. that person's not our enemy. There's somebody who's made in the image of God and they're worth going after. Sure. But they've been blinded by the God of this world, by Satan. And they're deceived. And he says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces right. of darkness. And, and it is a spiritual battle. And again, a lot of this, what we're talking about now, has already been explained in the previous exhibits through the creation walkthrough and then uh, the other rooms before that. So um, it's just kind of setting everything up to show why the Bible is true. Right. And then this, what we want to do in this panel is just from the book of Matthew alone, just take some of the, the key statements that Jesus made. People will recognize a lot of them, but usually what happens is they remember the, the, if I can say the positive or the happy ones, you know, to love your enemies, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You are the light of the world. Everybody likes remembering those. But what about the times when he said, I never knew you, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. What about when he called the Pharisees and the scribes serpents, brood of vipers? And he was, so not only did he encourage people and uh, speak um, the, these, these words that everybody thinks of as being, you know, in, Right. encouraging and, and loving and everything. But he also strongly rebuked people as well. And, and uh, that's because that's who God is. God is a righteous judge, but he's also our loving Heavenly Father. And Jesus is the perfect representation. He's the exact representation of the Father. So we see those teachings in, in the book of Matthew alone. And we also see that he prophesied that he's going to be executed, that he's going to be crucified and then rise from the dead. And that's how he's going to demonstrate who he is uh, beyond any shadow of a doubt. So then we wanted to see the power of the Savior. So we, our artists did these, these four panels that are just exquisite. And what they're doing is showing Jesus's power over several different things, over the natural world. So we see him walking on water. We know that he calms the storm. Uh, he can turn water into wine. He can multiply bread and, and fish. And so all these different things that he has power over the natural world. He has power over physical ailments, over, over sicknesses and diseases and disabilities. And he heals so many different people. And I love that our artist chose to do the healing of the blind because that was such a unique miracle for people. Think about when Jesus healed the blind man. Uh, in the in the book of John, and and the guy says, who's a, who's ever heard of somebody being, you know, cured of blindness when he was born blind? Mm -hmm. Because that a lot of the other miracles you can see repeated in the Old Testament, whether it was Elijah, Elisha, Moses, but not that one, not healing somebody born blind. And so that was a he did that multiple times. So I, I really like that we used that one as an example. Uh, for me, my, my favorite one that he performed is the raising of Lazarus, so I like that that one got special attention. Um, there, there's, he raised other people from the dead as well, the, the widow's son at the town of Nain and also Jairus' daughter. But Lazarus was really such a, 
a huge event. There were so, several witnesses that tells us in uh, John chapter 11 and John chapter 12 that many people came to believe in Jesus because of this event. It even got to the point where so many people were believing in him that the, the rulers of the Jews were upset about it. They sought a way to put Lazarus to death again. Mm. Wow. <laughs> so instead of believing what was right in front of them, that you know, Lazarus was dead and now he's alive again, it was, let's hide the evidence, let's ignore the evidence, let's get rid of the evidence. And you know, it's kind of interesting. We see that today in our world, don't we, in, in many ways. Yeah. Uh, we see a lot of times some of the skeptics will ignore or hide or lie about the evidence that's out there. Right. Nothing's really changed. No, it, it really doesn't. Um, because a lot of times it just comes down to the heart issue. They, the, a lot of people just don't want to believe. Um, and so they'll refuse to, even if, if, if the evidence is right there in front of them. Um, then we have the power of the supernatural world. Time and time again, Jesus cast, de cast out demons from people. Uh, one of the more famous ones is when he cast them into swine, and they ran down this hill and into the, into the water. So that's what's being depicted here. But uh, John even says, makes the point about, you know, these are just some of the things that Jesus had done. If, if we wrote down everything that he had done, it would, you know, not even the whole world could contain the books. And I think that's a little bit of a, a hyperbole. But he did so much more than just right here. This is just a representation of some of the ways he demonstrated his power. And then uh, we have just a, a few quick panels to explain some of the events leading up to the crucifixion. Uh, so that final week before the crucifixion, we had the triumphal entry where people hailed him as the Messiah, uh, the cleansing of the temple. I think for the second time, uh, we have an article on our website about that, that it seems likely that Jesus cleansed the temple once at the beginning of his ministry. That's recorded in John 2. And then again, uh, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, Matthew, Mark, and Luke talk about it at the end of the ministry after the triumphal entry. Uh, and then the Last Supper, which is one that I, like, I think a lot of viewers will be familiar with. Um, and this is where Judas heads out and he's going to betray Jesus, but Jesus washes the disciples' feet and as an act of, of how he wants them, as an example of how he wants them to serve others. And then he gives them the, the, the bread to eat and the wine to drink. And, uh, you know, different denominations will look at that particular event a little bit differently as how, you know, is the, the bread and wine just a representation? Is it more than that? Um, so, but we wanted to just describe the events real quickly. But then we get over to the crucifixion itself. And this is the type of image that people are familiar with, although our artist did a good job of giving us a, maybe a fresh angle mm -hmm. on looking at the event. And we see that, so each of these panels that you see off to the side at times, they're kind of a narrative that bring you into this scene. And we've seen them throughout. So this one is kind of catching us up. After he was betrayed, then here he was beaten, taken through these trials. He was mocked and ultimately led, even though he was declared innocent, he was led out to be crucified. Right. So we talk about why he was crucified. Um, it, the, the per he was going to be a sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. Uh, it wasn't, you know, like some people say, he just got mixed up with the Romans it, or, you know, with some of the, the leaders that, you know, he was caught up in some political thing. No, he came. This is why he came. And uh, that's why God sent him, so that he would die as a sacrifice for our sins. Uh, really, John 3.16 summarizes it well. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Um, then he dies on the cross. And uh, really, the, the artist did so much detail in here. If you look at the, what's known as the titulus, the, the, the sign above his, above his head, um, the Bible tells us that it was written in three languages, in, in Greek, in Latin, and in, depending on your Bible, it's the Aramaic or Hebrew. So we had to figure out exactly what that might have looked like at that time, when it says Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. What did, what did that look like in those different languages? And so I had to consult some of my uh, college buddies and professors to make sure we got this right. Um, so and they even did the same thing with this guy, who's one of the thieves on the cross. Um, it tells us that they were, a, they were thieves and murderers. So that's actually what this talks about, is this guy's a thief and a murderer in those different languages. So I think really one of the big theological points, in fact, the two big theological points in this exhibit, and you can probably see it if you, if you um, look at the it is finished sign, and then back behind it is the he is risen sign. And they, uh, so the it is finished, what this is about is that when Jesus died on the cross, there was no more need for a sacrifice for sin. That was the ultimate sacrifice. There's, there's nothing we can do that can earn salvation, merit salvation, because Jesus paid it all. All, you know, every sin we'll, we'll ever commit, everyone we've done in the past, everything that we might do today, everything that we might do in the future, it's 
it's gone. He nailed it all to the cross. And so that's uh, this point. But there's so many people who have bought in this idea that, yeah, I've got to believe in Jesus, but then I also have to do these good works. I kind of got to keep it. And that's, that's not what Scripture teaches, that it's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone that we are saved. So that's what this panel is talking about. And then my favorite, even though I love that one, but uh, we get to talk about the resurrection as well. Um, if it was just me, I would have made this whole exhibit, the resurrection, <laughs> even though I like the rest of it. But uh, those who are watching, I've written a book on the resurrection, and this, I just I love talking about it. Um, but we wanted to show uh, something a little bit different. So you see the angel rolling back the stone, and the, the soldiers are uh, you know, cowering in fear at that moment who, who are guarding the tomb. Uh, we talk about the narrative of that event, and then we also talk about some of the post-resurrection appearances. There's at least 10 of them mentioned in Scripture, so we put those in order. And then when he appears to Thomas, and Thomas had already told the, the disciples eight days earlier, you know, unless I see, unless I put my hands in the nail scars, I'm not going to believe. And then Jesus appears to him and says, here I am, Thomas. And it doesn't even say that Thomas did touch him. And Thomas just says, my Lord and my God. And I always say that that's the correct response to Jesus Christ, because that's who he is. So it, the other thing is he, and this narrative tells us that he told his disciples this is going to happen. Over and over again, he said, I'm going to be crucified, and then I'm going to rise from the dead. And he even said that the resurrection would be the one sign he would give to an, to an evil and adulterous generation. And so that's what that is about. And then 40 days after the resurrection, the, uh, people who know their Bibles know what happens at that point. Jesus ascends into heaven. And we use this to launch into the consummation because Jesus goes up into heaven, up into the clouds, and then the angels who were standing there by the disciples who were watching it said, why do you remain looking up in the sky? Jesus will return in like manner. So we can use that to launch into the discussion of Christ's return. Now, as a ministry, you know, we don't take an official position on certain end times events. Is, it, is there going to be a, a pre-tribulation rapture, mid-tribulation rapture, post-trib? We, that's, we don't do that? Is it, are we pre-mill, uh, mill, post-mill? We don't take a position on that. I like to, people always ask, and I say, well, we're answers in Genesis, not answers in Revelation. You know, it's a, it's a, that's a little trade. It's not, those things aren't just in Revelation, but I think they, they get the point. So what we're going to do is present just some big concepts from the very end, that Jesus is going to return to this earth in judgment. Um, but, and then there's really two destinies for all eternity for people. It's either going to be for the unrighteous in the lake of fire, and, or it's the righteous in the new heavens and the new earth. And uh, in Revelation, we see it being called the New Jerusalem. Um, so these are vision, These are pictures of John's visions. Here we see John in both of these. So, you know, we're not taking this position that, oh, this must be a literal place, this must be... That's, that's not what we're doing, even though many people believe that. Um, it's, as a ministry, we don't take that position. So we wanted to depict it in, what, in such a way that it's... This is just what Revelation tells us. John had these visions of these places. Uh, but it's really uh, dramatic artwork, and, and I think it accomplishes the purpose of what we're doing. Um, and to remind people that, you know what, if they don't trust in Jesus Christ, they do have an eternity waiting for them, but it's an eternity separated from God. And it's, it's one of torment. So it's not, it's not anything somebody should take lightly. So, then we, we have the gospel presented again. We've already walked through and seen all of the details of the gospel, but then it's a, this call, this appeal to the guests. You know, where are you going to spend eternity? Is it going to be in the lake of fire, or is it going to be in the new heavens and the new earth? And then what we did at the very end, the purpose of the Savior, it really wraps up the entire museum. You know, if you think about the, the seven seas, it begins at creation. We have Adam and Eve being created. The first Adam comes, and he messes things up. Okay, he eats from the fruit of the tree that he was not permitted to eat. And through that act, he brings sin and death and suffering and bloodshed into the world. And then the last Adam, Jesus Christ, comes. And he succeeds where the first Adam fails. He doesn't give in to temptation. He goes to the cross to physically die to defeat death and sin and bloodshed and all of those things that the first Adam brought in. The last Adam, Jesus Christ, comes to restore, to... Uh, and, and to save us. So that, that's why he came. And it, this message right here, the first Adam, last Adam, summarizes the whole museum in a way. 
So we are at the Creation Museum, and we are touring through the Christ Cross and Consummation exhibit, the new exhibit that was recently opened. And now we have a new exhibit that was recently opened at the Ark Encounter, don't we? What was that called? Uh, well, we've got several. <laughs> are you talking about the... The one that was very much related to this type of exhibit, the Gospel of Presentation. Oh, like the Why the Bible is True. Right. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the... There's so many things going on at the Ark. I didn't know if you were talking about the, the West Village, but um, which is just about ready to go. Sure. Um, but yeah, on the very top floor at the end of the walkthrough, we opened up an exhibit, was it late February or mm -hmm. something like that? Yeah. Um, where it's, it's called Why the Bible is True and you're walking through uh, like the pages of a graphic novel right. and you're following these three college students around their campus and as um, one of them's a believer, two are not, and he's got an opportunity to witness to his friends, defend his faith, and really we're following one of the unbelievers throughout and uh, we get to see her story and um, at the end the gospel is presented in, in a way that we call the doors right. of the bible and so you, many of these same details you're going to get as you go to the ark yeah, encounter as well yep yeah and then we do have a number of other things that are opening as you mentioned the west village and stuff at the ark encounter too so i encourage you to check that out at arkencounter.com and then for details about the creation museum you can go to um, creationmuseum.org and find out all the information about this, even get some pictures of this new exhibit. And um, well, uh, the, the, to wrap up, to, to end up the exhibit, we also have the, a preview for the Last Adam film to encourage people to go check that out because it will reinforce everything they've seen in here. But we also have another new exhibit in the museum with the um, Museum of the Bible changed out their exhibit. So oh, right. yes. yeah, just about a month ago, a month and a half, the is it a traveling exhibit? Do we call it that? Where about once a year they they switch out the the artifacts and everything. So there's a brand new one uh, in the Museum of the Bible, which uh, really looks spectacular as well. It has artifacts about dragons and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah, when you come to the Christ Museum, don't forget to check out the Last Adam because they're still showing that here. And um, check us out. Thank you, Tim, for being with us today. Uh, you're very welcome. It's a pleasure. This is my favorite exhibit in the museum because of the what it's what it's about. I mean, I right. love the whole museum, but this is, I think, this is the perfect way to end it. I tell you, one of the things I really appreciate is the comprehensive approach to the gospel. It's not just focusing on Christ's death and resurrection. It's setting it up. It's showing who God is, who Jesus is. I really appreciate that. Well, I think that's so important. I mean, if you think of like a some of the verses we quote when we try to share the gospel that, that if you confess through the mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead well think about those first words confess through the mouth Jesus is Lord well let's show people that let's show that that's right. exactly who we claim to be and so we wanted to walk people through those details for sure thank you everyone for joining us here today appreciate it